good afternoon on this exciting week uh, before spring break, um, but also happens to be midterm week. So, uh, you know, I don't know, things come together. Uh, so today we're going to get into the last of the, of the five practices action, but before that, um, uh, let's see, I think we have, do we have any guests? We, I know we have one guest. Yeah, would you introduce yourself? Yeah. My name is Keta Von Nua. I graduated from the Kennedy School in 2012. And I'm working on a project, um, lead elim eliminating lead in Georgia, uh, the country that where I'm from, is still using lead, lead in gasoline and paint. So I'm organizing a campaign to address this issue, and I will need Professor Kansas' help with this. So that's why I'm in this class. Good. Well, welcome. Um, yeah, this class will just figure it all out. Uh, <laughs> just today's session. No, I'm kidding. No, welcome. Uh, sounds like an interesting challenge. Uh, any announcements anybody wants to make about anything related to project or planning projects? We have more of those after the, after the break, I think. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, next Thursday is Independent Living Education Day at the State House. So uh, people with disabilities and allies from across Massachusetts will be gathering at the State House to advocate for more funding for affordable housing and other programs um, for the disability community. Uh, and that's at 10.30. Um, there's some speeches and then a chance to visit your legislators. <coughs> so it be a great chance for anybody who maybe doesn't have much experience talking to legislators but wants to gain some or just wants to speak out on that issue. Uh, come see me. I have flyers. Great. Thanks, Olivia. Um, and we're posting papers this week um, uh, from this week's papers by uh, Olivia, Sue, and Allegra, and Nick. Um, all different, all pretty interesting. Um, and um, um, I think all good examples of the whole process of strategizing and re-strategizing and how it works. Um, I want to, uh, we passed out about the midterm, and we're going to go through that in just a moment, but I want to set a little context for it first. Um, first thing is, you remember way back at the beginning of the class, like a year ago, whatever it seemed like, uh, there was a meeting by Carol Dweck about mindset, about growth mindset, fixed mindset. I think it's a very important um, way to frame learning uh, in this kind of a course because it's very challenging in unusual ways. And it's important to be clear about the distinction between me and what I've learned. And the Carol Dweck reading, I think, is really helpful. If you haven't, go back and take another look at it. It's, it's, um, it's very helpful. Um, the second thing I want to say is that the, the learning in the class itself is challenging because Lots of, um, there's lots of classes here in cognitive learning, uh, where we're learning concepts um, and some behavioral or learning skills. Um, this class happens to be about those things, but it's also about emotional learning. Makes it much more challenging. Uh, Ronnie Heifetz's class is about emotional learning. Um, and it, it, it's a whole other threshold of challenge and, and learning and growth, but it is also a domain of learning, just like concepts are, and just like skills are, so is managing the heart, which is a whole lot at the core of what a lot of this leadership and organizing work is all about. So uh, I wanted to put that, that out there because uh, people learn in different ways and different rhythms uh, to deal with those kinds of challenges. Uh, the third thing uh, I want to say about it is that uh, the rhythm of learning uh, we've noticed over the years is not incremental. It's, you know, you know how in statistics each week you learn a new, a new move, you know, a new whatever, you know. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you know, it's this week we learn, uh, anyway, it's been a while. But, <laughs> but it's a very incremental process where it's sort of, you know, steady, goes like that. That's not how this works. It's episodic. Uh, what happens is, uh, and I think that's because of the emotional content of learning, but maybe not, but I think so. I think they're somehow related because... The pattern will be somebody will go along like this and then bloop, and then bloop. <laughs> it's a much more punctuated kind of rhythm to learning. And so that's also something to be aware of. And of course, all this is said in the context of, um, of um, um, uh, Connie Gersick's work on projects and timing and mid midways and all that stuff. So this is kind of an important <laughs> moment. Um, we sort of did some looking at sort of the projects, at, at sort of where people were in their, in their work and in their projects. And, 
And um, it seems to sort into three main categories, or, or moments better. There's folks who are working with others. They're successful in getting commitments from others to take responsibility to work with them. And they have a clear project. That's one. Then there's folks that are working with others, but may not have a clear project. Or they are having a hard time translating working with others into getting commitments from others. It's a whole other threshold there about you know being able to actually challenge people to take responsibility and share that with you. And then the third category are folks who are not yet working with others. Um, and that's tough because it's very hard to learn this work without that. I mean that's sort of fundamental. Now I just wanted to sort that's kind of how we perceive what seems to be going on. And so we did some talking about how to coach to those different kinds of challenges and we'll be working with you on it. But the reason I'm sharing it now is because the, this midterm paper is an opportunity to engage with your understanding of where your challenges are and also where your game has been. Uh, and it's, it's a full four pages, luxurious, uh, not two pages. Uh, but that's what it is. And we passed out this um, paper that I just want to go through on the midterm. Um, the focus of the midterm is your organizing project. Um, there's sort of three elements there to put together. Yourself as a learner, and this is not so dissimilar from the reflection papers. Yourself as a learner, um, the conceptual framework that we're using, uh, and the evidence of what's actually going on in your project. So there's sort of three, three elements there. Uh, and uh, it says your paper should make an argument, make an argument, meaning <laughs> in this paper I will argue that, okay, make an argument, it's not a storytelling paper, it's an argument-making paper that is framed around the following statements. My project is working because, my project is not working because, okay? My project is working in these ways because, my project is not working in these ways because, okay? Uh, and uh, the point is to use evidence drawn from your personal experience in working on your project to support the claims that you make. Uh, and so that's the intent of this. And then we have a few do's and don'ts on it. Um, your paper should <coughs> have a clear, concise thesis statement, makes an argument. In this paper, I will argue that. Uh, specific and detailed references to your work so far. Um, insights about new learning in yourself, people with whom you're working. Um, tie your paper to the conceptual framework that we're using. Uh, that we're using. Um, you can use... Uh, you know, you can use readings or lecture class discussions to the extent that it's useful. But this is not to sort of show that you read everything. That's not the idea. It's to really focus on, on your experience. Um, consider using visual representations, charts, diagrams, models to convey ideas if that's helpful. Uh, that won't count against your four pages. Uh, and this is very important. Be clear about your role as an actor in the project. Uh, include the roles of other specific actors as well. Uh, the, the problem there, some, sometimes you'll read a paper where there's only one um, person in the paper, namely the person writing it. Uh, sometimes you'll read a paper where there's uh, nobody in the paper uh, because it's written in a passive voice. It's just like something happening out there. So we want you to be present in the paper, but your presence to the extent that you are working with others as working with others. Because that's kind of what the heart of this whole class is about, is working with others and, and engaging with other people, all that. I hope that makes sense. Um, these will be graded on a standard letter grade scale, 20% of your grade for the course. Don't need to reference any readings so forth outside the course. It says here approximately, that's wrong. It should be maximum of four pages, double spaced with 12 point font and one inch margins. Please number your pages. And it's due 5 o'clock on Friday. Um, by email to your TF. No, there's no reflection paper this week. This is in lieu of the reflection paper. Okay, questions? Yeah. I just want to clarify that this content was also emailed to you last night by Art. So a lot of people, I saw a lot of confused faces. You all have this in your email as well. Questions, questions? Yeah. So it says um, we should not reference any readings outside the course, but we should, we can reference readings 
from the material. Yeah, and it says you don't need to. I mean, if you want to, you know, quote Einstein or something, it's fine. But if it's relevant. But no, you don't need to. But yeah, you can reference certainly this stuff in the class if it's useful. So sometimes people sort of get confused and think they should, you know, it should be like a literature review, and that's not the point. Yep. Yeah, I was saying, uh, the other thing I said was, it's working in these ways, and it's not working in those ways. So I mean, distinguish. But we want you to, take a cl to make a claim about where, where, you see, where you see you are right now, and why you are there in that, in that place. And, and that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's what this whole exercise is about, really. Um, what else? Yeah. My project got off to a bit of a slow start. Is it okay to say it's too soon to tell, but so far it seems like these aspects are working and these aspects aren't? Yeah, but also reflect on why it got up to a, off to a slow start. In other words, that's probably there's a lot of learning there. And so, you know, or let's say you just shifted your project. I think we had somebody just shifted their project. Well, don't write a speculative paper about the future, but Reflect on why, why, and, and why that happened. What did you learn from making that shift, and sort of how does that ground what you're going to do now? So in other words, there's nothing since the beginning of the class. That's that's a whole range of experience that you've had grappling with this whole organizing thing, and all of that is useful, uh, grist for the mill, as they say, or or material for reflection, because you know the intent has been to do organizing projects since the beginning, and so it's been challenging uh, in different ways, and so. Yeah, I hope that, that's a good question. Thank you for that. What else? Yeah. If we do set readings from the course, do you care about the citation format? No. Can we just mention them? Yeah. 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 No, no, no. Yeah, I mean, just so it's clear what you're referring to, but no, what, what is it like? Cambridge uh, style? No. <laughs> We're not going to worry about that too much. But we want real evidence. I mean, the, where the evidence really counts is, is the specifics in your project. You know, generalizations just not cut it. They, they don't have any stuff to them. It's this, this person, this place, this thing, this happened, this event, this moment. That's where all the learning is, really. I mean, it's digging into that and then stepping back and saying, oh, I see what the pattern is. But that mushland in between is not, not very productive. What else? Yeah. What's really the trend? Uh, in order to uh, come up with what's really happening, do I need to be specific in that paper, or do I have the time to go back to my other weekly papers? Uh, probably not so much. Uh, <laughs> no, try to put what's most relevant in there. But yeah, I, you don't need to rehearse the whole context and all that. I don't think that's not the idea. But be careful what you assume. Put what's relevant in there to, to what you're what you're focused on. Um, yeah, but the people reading this have read all your prior papers, so there's a little kind of ground that you share there. So you don't want to have to just just repeat for the sake of repeating. Because think about the evidence that's relevant to the to, to the claim you're making. So that's kind of where the where the thing is. At. Other questions. And so what we'll do is um, we'll get these on Friday, we'll read them, and we'll get them back to you by the first class when we come back after break. So you'll have them back by that Tuesday with our comments. And that's so that we can have midway check-in. That's way so we can, we can take advantage of this moment and sort of, you know, it's a moment of sort of retool and all that. And at the same time, uh, we're asking you to evaluate the class and your learning in the class um, which is going to be online, because uh, we want to process that too and share that. So it's kind of a, a mutual process. Imbal, you want to explain about that? Yeah, so um, this afternoon after class, I'm going to be sending out, we're going to be sending out an email with a link to a survey similar to what you did at the beginning of class. <coughs> Just like the beginning of class, it does not affect your grade, and it is anonymous. Um, anonymous. So just make sure you submit that just as in, with the deadline of the paper, so by 5 p.m. on Friday. So paper due, evaluation due. 
And the evaluation has two purposes. One is to focus on improvement in the class, pedagogy, so forth, what's happening. And then the second is this broader research on learning uh, project that we have going that we want to check in at various points in time and kind of see how this process actually works so we can, we can learn from it. Okay. Ready? Good. So, was there one more question? Okay. Um, so, action. Um, you know, we, yeah, that's the top one there. <laughs> So in, in this conceptual framework of organizing and leadership, of mobilizing or of organizing people to turn their resources into the capacity they need to achieve goals and outcomes, we of course began with the narrative piece about the values as foundational and then moved from that to relationship building uh, and then from that to structure and then from that to strategizing. And I, at the beginning of the class I made a distinction between organizing and mobilizing. Uh, and uh, you remember skill session day? Remember when we went out on the street there? That was all about mobilizing. Um, action is about mobilizing. In other words, it, it is about, we built this infrastructure, we built this capacity, now how do we put this to work, mobilizing resources out there? Now it's not totally divorced from organizing, but it's like, it's like a shift. It's like in an election campaign when in the beginning you're focusing a whole lot on developing your volunteer capacity. And then at the end of that campaign, there's only one thing you're doing, getting people to the polls to vote. That is pure mobilizing. So, so that's kind of where the, where the shift is. And so the action part it focuses a lot more on the mobilizing, and that's what we're going to focus on in, in two ways. We're going to discuss it, and we're going to look at it in terms of the commitment dimension and the motivational dimension. And then we're going to uh, bring in the third piece of, of public narrative that we, um, uh, you know, we began way back in the beginning with the, with the story of Self Us Now, the self, we looked at uh, Susan, uh, Susan Christopher on the us, and we're going to look at an example of a story of now uh, today, which would then be how these pieces would be embedded within a public narrative of self, us, and then now is the call to action, the action piece. So, one way to think about mobilizing action is that. Um, so like a bow tie or, I don't know, different thing. Uh, it's, it's actually where the organizing gets to be real in the world. <laughs> uh, which means uh, there's resources out there in the world, time and money and so forth. And so this process then becomes one of mobilizing those resources, that is, bringing them, getting them committed getting them contributed, committed, mobilized to a, to a project, to a common effort, and then deploying those resources. So it's like I'm, I'm mobilizing your time and we're deploying it in the form of this uh, delegation to this policymaker, or I'm mobilizing your signature and we're deploying it with another 5,000 on behalf of this uh, effort. Or So think of it as a process of mobilization and deployment. But at the heart, at the center of it, is that word. What's that word? Yeah, familiar word? Uh, you know, if it hasn't been clear up to this point, I mean, that is what this stuff is all about. Uh, because it's not, you know, organizing is not about being able to go out and buy people's time. It is about motivating people to commit their time. And without that, there's nothing. I mean, that's, that's the coin. That's the coin of this work. Uh, and so mastering commitment is a crucial piece. And so we're going to focus on that a bit more today, on commitment. Uh, but the other crucial piece is uh, commitment to action that then generates more commitment because it's motivational. So it isn't just all about commitment. You know, if you're committed enough, you'll do X, Y, and Z. Also, X, Y, Z needs to be a source of motivation and engagement for a person that's being asked to do it. So we're going to look at both of those dimensions. But first, I just wanted to call attention to this chart over here, the resources chart. And it suggests, I mean, one way to break things down is, where are you going to mobilize resources from? Um, you've got, and, and what kind of resources? There's money resources, and there's time, or people resources. I mean, it's more complicated than that, but you know, there are those two categories. And then, um, 
Do you mobilize those resources from within your constituency, or do you mobilize them from outside your constituency? Um, it's an interesting question. What do you think about that? Why would you think it would matter? What difference does it make? Why is it important to think strategically about where the resources are coming from that you're going to be deploying in the effort that you're going to do? And what kind of resources we are? What, what would make, what, what, what's the deal? Yeah, Mona. I think it has to do with the level of control. If, uh, if they are, because in my constituency, then I have more uh, control on, on uh, how I'm deploying them. But if they are outside broader constituency, then I have to take it in board the interest of the book road one and, and, think, and they might have different values and different interests. Yeah. Well, I think you've got to fight to the heart of it pretty quickly. That's certainly one of the key factors. I mean, I don't know if you've ever had the experience of wanting to, you know, having a project where you're working with people to do one thing, and along comes a funder who says, well, that's kind of interesting, but if you do this, I'll give you a grant. <laughs> Does that ever happen? Mm -hmm. Boy, it happens all the time. you got a choice to make there. You know, who is your constituency? Is it, is it the funder? Or is it the people you're organizing? I mean, look, it sounds, it, here it sounds very, oh, that's an easy question. It's not. It, it is a challenging choice. And so it's important to think about, you know, because the point is that wherever your resources come from, ultimately, that's where your accountability rests, no matter what it is theoretically. You know, you have a theory of decision making, all this sort of stuff. But where the resources come from, you need to do your work. That is where you, what you will protect. That's what an organization will protect, that's what you will protect, and that's what you will take care of. And so there are some very important realities to, to acknowledge when it comes to where the resources come from and, uh, and to whom do I want to be accountable. What else? There's some more in here, I think. What other considerations? That was very helpful, Mona. Yeah, Valerie? Can you yeah. hear? Can you hear? Sorry, giving you the opportunity to see the contribution of resources as indication of whether your inside or outside groups are uh, aligned with your current strategy. Because, That's great. like, I've certainly <coughs> been you know, the leader of efforts that people have said they wanted, and then you have time and money, but nobody shows up to do it. So, you're like, okay, what do I need to do to be able to tool this? Or, but if you get mostly interest from the outside and you're responding, maybe to something. On the inside, I thought that they wanted to actually want to do. So, how do you, how do you allow the, the flow of resources to introduce your strategy? Yeah, that's a great, great point. Uh, excellent. If nobody shows up, hmm, I guess there's something wrong here. <laughs> you know, I'm depending. No, that's, that's great. What else? This is, this is some of these indicators that are really kind of important to pay attention to. What else, what else do you see here? Yeah, all right. So, how much are you <coughs> explicitly connecting with the resources to? That the more money and people you have inside, the more power you have to do what you want. Yeah, and why would that be? Because you don't have outside interests dictating your direction. Yeah. Uh, but is that the, is, are you are you saying that the, the focus of your action is also trying to organize those resources and trying to organize money for them, organize people? Yeah. Well, I, and I think that makes an additional point. Which, which actually this chart is meant to suggest, and I think it's a great point, Eric, that how you deploy the resources then has a lot to do with where they come from. <laughs> In other words, you can, you can think of this uh, loop as um, not static, but sort of expanding or shrinking. So imagine uh, income grant, grant gets spent, project done, right? Had that experience? Program over, okay. Um, in comes time, skill, dues, money. It's used in such a way that it generates more, <laughs> not less. Uh, it's it, like, well, one of the things I liked about union organizing was that as you built your membership, you also built your resource capacity because the dues, the, the money came from the membership. And so as you built membership, you were building more capacity. And so you were actually getting, that loop was getting bigger and bigger rather than smaller and smaller. So th this is what this, you want to really think about this stuff. Because unless you're building capacity to survive the end of the grant, well then it was a nice little grant. 
And that's one of the trouble with, you know, the way we fund a lot of stuff these days. So no, thanks, Eric, for, for pointing that out. I think it's, and it has to do then with this whole money, time, am I mobilizing people's time, am I relying on money? <coughs> you know, uh, electoral campaigns got to the point where even people work, like door-to-door -door, uh, work, was all a function of money. Because it was all paid canvassing. It was hire your consultant. So ultimately, it always became a question of where you went, got the money, not the volunteers. That's something we were able to reverse a little bit in Dean and Obama's efforts. By, I mean, it was a deliberate intent to shift to volunteer time. Because then, that, then you're beholden to those people and not to the other people. So th there's no easy answer here, but I just want you to really think about this and appreciate kind of how this works. Um, when I was in the farm workers, we, we never went anywhere but that we had a can <laughs> and, a, and, a, and a list, I mean a, a clipboard. What was the purpose of the can? Money? And the clipboard? Time. That's right. People. And if, and if, you, didn't, if you didn't come away from an event with some money and some names, then you, you didn't get it. You were missing it. Because we were conscious of the fact that we could constantly be generating capacity. Otherwise, we were just spending down. It's like the Bob Dylan song, you're busy being born or you're busy dying. It's sort of, there's no stasis. It's kind of, you go in one way, one way or the other. Now, in, in New York City, we, <laughs> we got very good raising money on the street in Manhattan with cans um, during our boycott period. Uh, and I was a farmer named Marcos Munoz from California who, who loved raising money in New York. He says, because it's so easy in Manhattan because every morning people, they all come out of these holes in the ground. And all you have to do is stand by the hole in the ground. And then, all they tell, and then at night they all go back. And so you just place yourself strategically. Uh, and I was walking along one day with a can and a, and a sign. Um, and only it wasn't a can, it was a cup of coffee that I was carrying. <laughs> and somebody just tossed a quarter in my cup of coffee because they were so used to So anyway, but it's, it's you know, uh, I'm using those examples because they're just so simple, so direct. It's not proposal writing and all. It's going direct to people and getting what you need. So, um, on that. Now, let's go to this question of commitment and that. Um, Who's finding it really easy to get commitments? <laughs> Why is it so hard? Why is it so hard? Yeah. I found it easy, actually. Why do you find it easy? <laughs> we all want to come in here. <laughs> yes, but I believe in what in my project. And it was easy because of the energy I'm hoping that I, you know, transmitted to my constituents that I got the commitment, they got the value because they also on the same page. I hope So why is everybody finding it hard? Pat's the only one that believes in her project. I, but you can feel that belief from from her. I, there's no question about it. I, I think. I mean I ever since we first talked, it was just you sort of um, put it out there. And 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 it's attractive. And, and no, and I think it's really, I think it's a great, a great point, but yeah. I mean, I think there's something that we need to distinguish in terms of commitments, because there's commitments in terms of like, oh, I'll do the homework and here it is, or there's like a big commitment, like this is your life, this is what you're going to do with it, I'm committed to this cause, I'm in this movement. I think it's e like semi-easy to get commitments in terms of like organizing, like I'll bring the food, but like in terms of the actual movement, I think it might be soon. Well, if you yeah, think... Like, I don't, or how do you measure that? Well, if you way, think, I, if you, I mean, if you think of it on a spectrum, I mean, there's from, there's from, you know, give me a dollar or sign my petition, here, quit your job and come to work full time for the next 20 years, right? Yeah. And so, not everybody's going to do this. <laughs> but for some reason, it's hard even for the first one. Uh, I mean, that's, that's what's a little, yes, of course you'd expect somebody to, you know, that's kind of tough. Again, when I was in the farmers, we always had that option. We always said, well, you can do this, this, and you can also quit your job and have to work full time. And sometimes people would. But, but that's, but why is it? So, yeah, Michael. I think, I, you know, just from my own experience, I think we just fear to be rejected. You know, fear to ask somebody for a commitment, and maybe they're not, they don't, they say no, but this is not the nice thing to experience. So how, how do we experience that? So I'm asking you to, 
commit to come to a meeting for my project or sign a paper or something, and you say no, why would I experience that as so terrible? Why, why would I think it was so terrible? I mean, what, why would I feel that was so terrible? Uh, you know, let me go, who hasn't? Oh, yeah, Mona and Dari, yeah. No, I've experienced this uh, a couple of weeks ago, and it was really terrible. <laughs> Why? <laughs> well, I, I was so in, engaging in, in telling the idea, and um, part of it was telling my value. Mm -hmm. And the rejection yeah. was not just a rejection to uh, an app, it yeah. was a rejection yeah. to my value. Yeah. It was yeah. kind of rejecting me uh, <coughs> along with it. Well, you're nailing it today. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I think this. That really says a lot. We get confused. This is an evaluation of me. It's not an evaluation of you. They don't begin to know enough about you to evaluate you. They're saying no to an ask. It's not you. It's your ask. It's not you. Making that distinction, getting into clarity about that distinction is crucial to be able to do this work. Because nobody can go around all the time feeling like the world hates them. You know, I, I mean, it's like, that's the, so, so understanding there's a distinction there. Uh, and there's also, you know, even when they say no, is it all because they don't think what you're asking is important? I mean, do people have other things going on in their lives? We used to have the broken vase there, you know, it's like when, when our, the family heirloom, I guess it was called, when uh, doing cold, cold phone calling to call somebody to recruit for a campaign. Hi, this is so-and-so, you come, and they say, oh, I'm sick and tired of it, boom. And the person's, oh my God, what did I do? <laughs> yeah, well, they didn't do anything. It's just that just before the phone rang, the person knocked the 500-year-old family heirloom vase <laughs> off the piano and broke it, and that's what was going on. It had nothing to do with you. So, see, reading everything as a judgment of you is problematic <laughs> in so many ways. Yeah, Kat? I, I appreciate that. Yeah. know your values. So it's one thing if you're standing on the subway and a stranger passes by versus somebody that you've known, you go to school with, and is intimately part of your community, knows how much this means to you and doesn't want to make the time. So how can you deal with that? I think it's a great point. You know, we talked about public and private relationships and how challenging it is to move from private relationships to public relationships. And, and, the, and I think you're illustrating one of the reasons that, that it gets confused. How can you deal with that? Yeah. things that we unlock and that is why she did not want to invest time in this project. And the way I got to know this is because I asked I asked her back as to what is stopping you because she Great. clearly shared the values. She clearly felt a lot for the uh, cause. Yeah. But she just said no and then asking help. That's a that's a great tactic. <laughs> you know what? I'm gonna learn something from this. I'm gonna ask. That's, that's, uh, yeah, yeah. So I'm wondering if I can follow up with a question. Somebody who was in my initial leadership team recently backed out of a commitment that he made and said, spoke to me about how he just couldn't continue to be involved in the campaign that he was in. And I'm wondering if, um, so a lot of us, probably all of us, have, or have heard or have heard these types of, like, well, this is not number one priority for me. How, how do we figure out how much of this has to do with that other person's um, decision, you know, legitimate decision to not want to be involved, and how much of it has to do with us not articulating that fear urgency now, like being Great able question. to compel people good, well enough? Well, when you figure that one out, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, uh, how can, it's, no, you're, you're making judgment, but, but the point is you are making a judgment about that. And, and that's different, because then, then it's not a judgment about you. Then it's a judgment about that person's priorities versus how well you were able to make understood. This is not your. This is your your craft. This is not you. The, the circumstances and uh, sometimes it's going to be one. Sometimes it's going to be the other. But I think just to ask the question in that way is really smart because then you can you can look at at what you know and try to figure it out and try to learn that. 
I mean, the second thing we're going to talk about in just a few minutes, though, is about designing work in such a way that it creates more motivation, not less. Because see, so often we think it's like, I've got to get them committed, and then um, they're committed to, you know, just, you know, be on a phone bank for 100 hours a day or whatever, and then if, you know, that's just not, people don't work that way. So there's another piece to it. But I think it's a great, it's a great question. There is a couple of things to be aware of. Uh, one is uh, consistency theory. Um, and consistency theory is very helpful to understand because um, we often sort of think people have like a finite resource over there, and if I ask them for a small commitment, then I can't ask them for anything. You know, they have sort of a commitment bank. And, and the more I ask for, the more the bank is going down, the less I'm going to be able to get. That's kind of a, I don't know, a hydraulic theory, I guess. But the reality is quite the opposite. The reality is that once a person commits to do something, even sign a petition, they are more likely to commit more, not less. And, and the more they commit, the more they are likely to commit more. And, 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 and this is because what consistency theory is about, it says that when we act in a certain way that's consistent with a particular identity, a particular way of thinking of ourselves and understanding, we are more likely to, con to, to reinforce that. We're more likely to take the next step, more likely to take the next step. And so people who volunteer are more likely to give money, not less. People who give money are more likely to volunteer, not less. And, and so, you know, as campaigns and so forth come to understand this, you know, that's kind of how, how this process works. But it's important to understand it. Because you, it's, you're giving them an opportunity to continue acting in ways that they care about in the first place or they wouldn't make that initial commitment. I mean, it's also the thinking behind the first one's for free, but no, it's not, it's not really. Because for free, it doesn't accomplish the commitment. See, it's that first small act. That's why the difference between an awareness campaign and, and something where people have to actually sign something, say something, do something, is day and night. Because you're really going to be getting something there. Yeah, Julie. Um, I kind of have a... He showed me the sign up seven minutes over. Yeah. yeah. Um, sort of a, a response. I don't know if this is helpful at all, but one of the things I noticed at the very beginning of my campaign was um, sort of having that sort of dejected feeling when people are like, oh, you know, I'm black, you not interested. Um, and then I started to try to think about, you know, what are different ways that people can be plugged in, like, outside of, like, my leadership team. And I don't know if it would have worked for the people at the beginning, but I found that I've been able to get people to take on smaller commitments um, by sort of re-asking, okay, you can't commit to this, um, but would you be willing to work um, on this? Yeah. Um, or can you follow up? And that's kind of been helpful for at least two people, and yeah. that's something I've been trying. Um, it seems to have kind of been somewhat helpful in terms of um, getting people to, to commit to this if they can, because everyone has different schedules. No, but I think that's right. I mean, it's like, and that really supports the consistency theory idea. You know, you get get some. It's going to sound, you know, get them hooked. You know, it's like get get somebody to do something that they can do, and then build from that. But see, that's not the end. That's not all she wrote. Once that's the beginning of a process of, of ongoing engagement. That's that's important to be clear. And you know, it's it's about the the motivational stuff we've talked about. You know, the the urgency and all that. It's about uh, making uh, steps meaningful and and, and available. I mean, sometimes I think we're afraid to ask for to, to ask for commitments because we're afraid people will accept, not reject. Because if I ask you to commit to something, what else is the re and you say yes? What else is the result? I'm committed. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> and so you know it, it, that's why it's a scary thing. It goes on both ways. And so finding this way to kind of move through it is really important. One one last thing I want to. Well, two, two, just two other points I want to make about it, because I need to move on to, to the other part, is that um, once you get a commitment, it's not it, it, making them stick really matters. Uh, you know, when we do house meeting campaigns, we get somebody committed to do a house meeting. I mean, we're sitting right there with the person while they make the first phone calls to invite people to that house meeting. Why is that? To teach them? Yes, but why else? Why do we sit there and ask them to make the first calls to invite people to come to their house meeting? Why else would we want to so make it? Yeah. So they actually do it because what? What happens once they start calling people out there and inviting them to come to their house meeting? They're committed. Yeah, they're really committed because they've committed by getting other people committed. Then they're really committed. Then it's like, you know, it's not theoretical that maybe they might do it or not. So it's sort of thinking about how to then follow through on the commitment. 
And that's where things like checking in and reminder calls, and it's a whole science when it comes to, you know, like electoral work in terms of, of you know, follow-up and, and, uh, and all that sort of thing. Um, and um, there's sort of different theories about um, when's the most effective time to make a, a reminder call. What do you think is the most critical time to make a reminder call where somebody's committed to come to a meeting? When? Day of? An hour before? Day before? All right, they're all good, but you know what the most crucial one is? The hour before. Now, just think about this for, <laughs> for the two hours before. You know, you said you're going to go to your friend's meeting, or somebody's meeting, right? You're going to show up to the meeting. It gets closer and closer. You got all this other stuff going on, right? Jeez, uh, why did I commit to that? Does that ever happen to you? Why did I say I would? And it gets closer and closer, and oh my God, yeah. You know, oh, I got to blow it off because I just got to do this. And then the phone rings, uh, or the, or the, or you get a text or whatever, and it's like, hi, uh, this is Joe. Just uh, we're really looking forward to see you uh, in in a half hour down here. Uh, uh, with the cookies that you promised to bring. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll be there. Now, is that pressuring people? Well, I think it's helping, it's scaffolding their commitment. It's sort of helping people follow through on their commitments. And we're human beings, you know? We, we, uh, our, our, our priorities shift. I mean, it's just, and so it's sort of engaging in your part of the deal. Is this matters? It's important. They wouldn't have agreed to do it in the first place if they didn't think it was too. But you know, there's a rest of life going on. So you want to make every effort you can. And that's what the reminder calls and all that are about. Uh, and actually, in an organization, you either have a culture of commitment or you don't. I mean, uh, the reality is that either people get that people, when they commit to things, they show up, or they don't. Or you don't have that. I mean, it, it's, 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 it's one of the crucial things. In a small group, we commit to do things the following week, and then we show up and half are done and half aren't done. you got a culture of not doing. And it's just going to go downward. And so we, we talked about groups and setting norms and the, you know, the important norms. One of them was about commitments. How you're actually going to handle them and be clear about them and actually mean them and not have people make ones they can't keep. So there's a whole thing around this. But I want to shift to another side, which is the motivational side. Because there's, there's also the whole piece about what it is we're asking people to do. Um, so would you come and sit on this phone bank? How many people have ever been on a phone bank? Everybody know what a phone bank is? A row of phones. <laughs> it's a bank of phones. Uh, and people coming in, and they're sitting there for two hours making phone calls to voters or to contributors or to, if you've seen on PBS, you know, when they're doing their fundraising and stuff, you see those people, you know, that's like a phone bank. And so, it, you know, and it's a very common sort of volunteer activity in campaigns. It used to be. I think this is probably changing with social media, but, but it certainly used to be. Uh, and so uh, you say, I want you to come and make this, you know, on my phone bank for three hours tonight to do whatever. And um, is it exciting? <laughs> I don't know. In, let me see again. How many people actually have done phone banks? Um, when was it awful? When was it awful? When, when were you phone banking? It was really awful. People hanging up on me. People hanging up on you. What else? Yeah. Election day. What was awful in that? Uh, people had already voted. So you didn't feel like you were making any difference? Yeah, what else? Yeah, uh, election day was the day before it, when people are already tired of having so many phone calls. So you want to feel, again, it sort of sounds like you feel like you're wasting your time. Plus you're getting a lot of rejections. Yeah? And also, where did you get my phone number? Oh, yeah. I've <laughs> said a lot angrier. <laughs> Has anybody had a positive experience on phone packing? What was it? A lot of commitment from people. Yes, I want to know more. I'm going to go to the meeting. Please call me back and remind me. So it was, 
I well, you had it's a, awesome. You had a good phone list, I think. <laughs> and, and, and you were making good, good, uh, you must have been making good calls. There, there's a, yeah, Roman? So I haven't <clears throat> participated in the phone bank, but I, as part of my job, I've, I've made a lot of calls, like yeah. cold calling, basically, yeah. getting people to act a certain way. And I think what works well is to have lowest expectations possible. You hope for the best, <laughs> but if you go in thinking that every other person will agree with you, then you're you're screwed. After one day, you're gonna try to commit suicide. Yeah, but if we you don't come want in that. Now, that nobody, that everyone will reject. You can yeah. pleasantly surprised. There is a whole thing about cold calling. I, yeah, when when I was in high school, my first real experience was uh, selling encyclopedias. I hate to admit, uh, which is a total con. Uh, but what I did learn, <laughs> no, it is. But 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 it is. But uh, but uh, but I learned to make cold calls. It's just sort of like you got to get in a kind of framework there. And just go into it, but 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 there's more to it than that. And and there's a debate in the literature that comes from how work is designed about whether people are more motivated by incentives that have nothing to do with the work, or whether they're more motivated by incentives that are built into the work. I mean, this whole paper performance stuff that you've heard about paper performance stuff. A lot of it is based on the notion that you can motivate people by um, rewarding them in ways that have nothing to do with the actual work that they're doing. Now, it's a controversy. But generally, generally, it's coming down on the side of what's called intrinsic motivation over opposed to what's called extrinsic motivation, especially when it comes to tasks that require any kind of imagination or any kind of deep level of commitment, as opposed to just kind of a routine performance. And what extrinsic motivation means that if the work is designed in such a way as to be motivational by doing it, then uh, people are going to be motivated, uh, and you'll get certain results. And what you get when you have a, a well-designed task or piece of work is you get, you get quality, that people care about it. You get problem solving. You get people taking initiative to solve problems that come their way. And you get um, more commitment. You're more ready to come back and commit and keep doing more of it. Now, this is one of those things that there's a lot of research about, a lot of social psychological research about that's actually very helpful. Because we learned that in order to get this over there, uh, this is like our, our, our group thing, uh, there's five elements involved, five sort of factors involved. They're called, the first one's called task significance. The second one's called task identity. The third one's called uh, variety or diversity. The fourth one's called autonomy. And the fifth one is called feedback. Now, if you design what you're asking people to do in such a way that it's built on these principles, then uh, they're much more likely to come back. Um, and what does this mean? Task significance. Any, I think this is in the reading. Anybody? Task significance. What, what's your understanding of task significance? Uh, yeah. Well, that you're playing really makes a difference, that you can kind of see the end result. That's here. That's task identity. Okay? Let's stay with task significance. You on the back? Um, how it fits into the bigger picture yeah. So this phone, these phone calls you're making, this is going to decide who's elected president. Well, but maybe governor, but know that there's a link being made between the task and something, something you value in the world that actually could change or be influenced by it. It's not trivial. You know, I mean, I don't know if you, I've been to phone banks where they just, you show up to volunteer, here's your list, go sit on the phone. That's it. Significant? Uh, gee, I didn't feel like that. You know, think about volunteer tasks and how they call it shit work, which I think is just an abomination. That's, it's the precious contribution of people's time that creates the power of the organization. To call it that is just so, so backwards. It's just have your, have your head on completely backwards when it comes to it. Because you want to honor that work. And so, so recognizing the significance. What's task identity then? Who, who said, yeah? Seeing the end result of your work. See, this is like, I've got a chunk of this work that I'm responsible for. And it'll be visible whether or not I accomplished it. You know, tonight, I'm responsible for identifying 50 voters in these 10 precincts or whatever it is. That's, that's my mission. 
And it's going to go up on there in the chart with everybody else. We're going to see what happens. Or I'm responsible for the whole reception operation for our program tonight. I'm responsible for the how people come in and sign up and how to, or I'm responsible for the uh, whole presentation of the meeting. Or it's recognizing chunks of work that people can be responsible for. That's task and entity. Skill variety, that's the third one. Sorry. Skill variety. <laughs> Skill variety. What does that refer to? Yeah. Kind of using different parts of your brain and skills to accomplish whatever task you have. Yeah, and how about even using your brain? I mean, how about come in and sit here and just repeat this script exactly as it's written for you. Just read it over and over and over. Using your brain? <coughs> Not much. So it's, it's thinking about designing things so that they engage us in, in more full ways. What about autonomy? What, what does that mean? Autonomy. That's a, it may be not so great a word for this, but yeah, I'm right. Yeah, you have, it doesn't mean it just, oh, I'm free to just do it any way I want. It means that I have a scope in which my decisions, my choices about how to do it matter. You know, that, that because otherwise, how can I feel responsible? I mean, I'm just doing what somebody told me. I'm just following orders. I can be responsible for that. But if you actually have a domain in which you have some choices to make, that's what this refers to. And what about this last one, feedback? What feedback? Yeah. Some mechanism by which a person sees uh, throughout the course of a project that their work is being uh, effective or, or not. Or not, exactly. You know, it's like it's not like coming. It's not running around and patting people. Oh, you're doing great. You're doing great. Or oh, here's some cookies. That's not feedback. Okay. That's sometimes confused with feedback. Feedback is exactly what Cameron said. It's, it's being able to see that you're making progress or not. You know, video games are really good for this. <laughs> no, they figured all this stuff out. No, I mean, just think about, you know, some of those really addictive video games. I don't know if anybody here has ever had any experience with that. But, but you know, you can think about it. Uh, it's, uh, and the feedback, sort of being able to know where you are, because that's what you need to learn. So if you design something with this framework in mind, whether it's passing out leaflets or making phone calls or, or whatever it might be, the odds that people are going to come back do well, they go way up. And then it's not a test of endurance whether a person completes their volunteer task, it actually becomes an opportunity. And I want to just give an example of that. Let's take a phone bank. You know, everybody has a phone bank. You know, let's imagine, see there's a tool that comes out of it, there's a diagnostic tool that comes out of this, which is you can take any task you're asking people to do, and on a scale, you can rank it, and in the reading, there's a, there's a chart to sort of say, well, is this a one, or a two, or a three, or a four? And that way, you can kind of get a handle on how motivational it is, see where you need to adjust it, and how to change it. So when it comes to a phone bank, what's an example of an insignificant? What would be a one? Here's a phone bank. You're coming in to volunteer for this phone bank. A uh, task significance, one is bad, five is good. What would be an example of the number one phone bank? You show up, what happens? Huh? You're told to call the list of, uh, of funders that had already been called, uh, let me to check you again. Well, that's, that's likely to not be so great, but what's, but just think about where you're just not recognizing the importance of the significance even at all. Yeah, that's fine. Well, that would sure do it. You, know, you show up to volunteer and nobody's there. Uh, no, I, so, so, yeah. I was going to say, if you show up and they don't really have anything to do it. Well, that'll sure do it. But let's say they want to put you on the phone bank, but, yeah, Valerie? If the link isn't clear, if it's like, oh, we're going to reform California politics, here's a list of the farms. Yeah, or, thank you, good. That, no, that's a great example. You'd be surprised how, much that kind, how often that sort of thing happens. Or they even forget about reform Cal Pol California politics. Just here, here's your list. That actually happens. So now, what would what would a five be? Show up. Somebody shows up to volunteer to do a phone bank. What would what would task significance? How would you make it significant? Yeah, uh, let me see if we can hear from somebody else. Mona, you've been right on target, but let's, let's hear some more voices. Yeah. Uh, maybe you're asked uh, if you. Have 
Okay, that's down the list. Past significance. Past significance. Yeah. Somebody sits down with you and explains why, how this, this phone bank fits into the bigger campaign. Yeah. Yeah. You know, all over, all over time. Yeah, Maggie? I think also feeling that your personal contribution to that campaign matters. So when the person shows up, it's like, oh, we're so glad that you're here. We have this phone for you. We've been waiting for you. We can't get through this without you. Well, and that's going to go here, but it's going to have a little more substance. Let's just stay with this first one. You know, tonight our mission is to contact X number of people all over the state. And our responsibility in this area is, is, is this many. And, and here's why, right? We only have three days left until X, so we have to get this number tonight. And, you know, I don't, you know, I have to remind you that, you know, who's elected governor is going to make a big difference. Remember why you volunteered for this campaign in the first place. That's the kind of task significance. It's linking what's being asked to do to the value that it may or may hopefully accomplish at the end. Yeah? Where would um, connecting with the rest of the team, like all of the other callers on the phone bank, fit in? Because I feel like that's also an important component. Yeah, it is. The whole relational dimension is, it can be a very, very important part. And, you know, as a team, we're trying to do this and so forth. But this is sort of linking the task to the bigger thing. Now, task identity. What would be a, an example of, a, of an identity, identity-less task? Phone bank. You show up. It's designed in such a way that there's no task identity. What would that be? Yeah? Maybe you have no idea how many calls you have to make. No idea how many calls. What else? Yeah? Oh, that that's good. Yeah. Okay. Wrong name. What else? Oh, similar, but if they just say like get through as many as you can. Yeah, we're doing as many as we can. Uh, do they ask for your results? Do they put them on a chart anywhere? Do they? Do they? See, it's just a totally anonymous. Yeah. Anybody. What would make it a five? Task identity. We, we've got clues here. What would make it a five? A really good, a strong, lots of task identity. Yeah? What did you find mostly? How many people were you managed manage to get through? What kind of people were these? You sure want to ask all that, right? But even before, when you set it up in the first place, what would it be? <coughs> we've had several ideas around here. What would it be when you set it up in the first place? Remember, we were talking about the, the, the task we have. Yeah? Maybe you're responsible for a particular neighborhood. Uh -huh. you know whether you, that neighborhood got down or not. This is going to be your, your neighborhood here. This is the goal. Goes up on a chart. There's your name next to it. We see what the results are going to be. It is really concrete. There's no ambiguity about what your responsibility is. That's task identity. Then, how about this one? The skill variety. The absolutely variety -less task. I think I, I sort of parodied it before. Just sit here and call the script. How could you introduce some skill variety into a phone bank? Yeah? Let's write the script. <coughs> yeah, participate in writing the script. Ha have have some, some part in that. Draw on your own experience. What else? Yeah? Give them a script, but encourage them to use their own intuition and judgment in, in connecting with people and just use that as a starting point. Uh, yeah, but maybe even have a little training session, exchange ideas, get the idea that this is brain work, not just not just rote. Uh, good ideas, bad ideas. Check in at midpoint, and see how it's going, and learn from people how they're how they're learning. See, it's just you just you think about that. What about autonomy? It, it sort of relates to what we're just talking about. I have some discretion about how to do this, as opposed to no discretion whatsoever. I can vary my. I may prioritize differently. And the final one, I'm just speeding up because of time, the feedback. What about feedback with a phone bank? What would feedback look like, effective feedback? Yeah. From the yeses you get. Yeah, when do you find out? You chart it up. You find out right as you're going. You market it up there. And now with, with the computer stuff, it's so much easier to do. You can actually see the progress you're making or not making. And, and it is so useful. So if you think, yeah, Julia? I, just, I think another way of feedback that might be useful would be checking in. So if there's someone else being there, being like, hey, how's it going? What's working? What's not working? I think that that could really 
uh, that could be a feedback that's really helpful. See, the tricky thing is, no, I agree with you. The tricky thing is that sometimes being nice to people is considered a substitute, is considered feedback. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like, oh, you're doing great. You're all doing great. Let's have a cheer. You're all doing great. Uh, it's not a feedback. Uh, and it's sort of a, you know, that's the cookies and Kool-Aid or whatever. That's not it. It, it, when you say, yeah, you actually want to learn and work with them on what's working, yeah, that's real. And, and I agree with that. That's kind of what's meant by this. So, look, so you can take, as we're getting ready for the movie scene, so you can take any task and evaluate it and see where you, how you can. Now, there's one other benefit to this, and that's over here. Whoops. Um, Leadership. How could you turn this into an opportunity for leadership development? This phone bank deal. So you got a bunch of people in phone banks. How could you turn it into an opportunity for leadership development, looking at how you might modify the task here? Who's got an idea on it? Yeah. Okay, that's good. I mean, that'll make them more effective. But, but you're looking to sort of, you know, move people up in terms of responsibility and authority. Yeah, Rebecca? Um, identifying what strength they have. So if they were really fast at something, maybe using that to teach others, like, what, what, oh. what made you so fast at that? Are you using a particular... So now we have the phone banker, <laughs> and now we have the phone bank coach. We see somebody that's really good. We... Move it up a little bit, a little bigger task identity, a little more skill variety. Now they're starting to teach others because they're good at it, and they can start coaching others. Maybe they have a little more choice about that. Right? Now it's feedback on the people they're coaching. And how could you take it to the next level? Well, but the bigger commitment related to the phone banking would be what? We've got phone bankers. Now we've got phone bank coaches. What might be the next level? Yeah. To strategize to bring up a new list maybe for a next time. That's a new task. What might new responsibility might go with that? Huh? What? Yeah, you might have a phone bank team leader. Now you got your team. Now there's more responsibility. And then maybe you become the phone bank coordinator over here. All the time you're moving up mainly autonomy, you're moving up task identity. You see how this works? See, the point of this is that the way you design volunteer work, first of all, it can be motivational or it can be deadly. That's, you want it to be motivational. But more than that, it can be designed in such a way that you have built in leadership development with it. You, you, it's like the thing of passing out leaflets. I mean, I can get two people to spend all their time in the yard passing out 5,000 leaflets. Or I could find three people from each of the residents' houses to come to a meeting, give them some training, ask them to take responsibility for getting X number of leaflets out in their houses. Oh, and by the way, getting some commitments too. Wind up passing out the same number of leaflets. The first one, do I develop any leadership? Zero. Second one, it's all about leadership development. So you have choices to make about how you design these tasks and whether there are ways to surface people and give them opportunities to develop. And you need that because we all need more leadership in these efforts. So that's kind of the point of this part. Does this make sense? So on the one side, you've got to struggle with the, with the commitment demons, right? <laughs> but on the other side, this can be really cool because you can, you can sit there and design things in such a way that they're gonna, people are going to actually learn, gain, and grow from it. And then you've got a ladder to start to develop people that can work with you more. And it's just phone bags as an example. So this stuff's in the reading, but this takes this whole thing of mobilizing and I think takes it a whole other, other step. Um, the, um, so that in the end, what you get, if you do it well, is not only, this should look familiar, not only that you've made all the phone calls, but that you've actually created a capacity for phone calling and you may also have helped develop some people who then have capacity to go on and develop others. And that's kind of the, the logic of this. Now, we have, I know there's more stuff we can talk about. We have one other 
thing to accomplish here. Um, and that is to uh, look at the story of now. Ready for looking at the story of now? Um, just to review briefly. So public narrative, how to translate values into sources of motivation for action. And the story of self using narrative to communicate why you're called. The story of us to remind people of the values they share that becomes a basis for motivation. And what's the story of now then? What's the story of now? What's it supposed to do? Anybody remember? Huh? Create urgency, right? What else? Action. It's supposed to result in a commitment or not of some kind, a choice, right? A choice to act or not. It's about urgency and it's also about hope. So it's like taking this, this cause that we have, bringing up the urgency of it, the hope of it, but then translating it into a specific choice to commit or not to commit, not sometime in the future, but right then and there. So we're going to look at an example of that. Now, you know, this is a little far from our direct experience. This is Gandhi in South Africa. Uh, this was actually his first, you know, he studied, of course, from India, studied for the bar in England. And, and his first real work was in South Africa, with the Indian community in South Africa uh, in the early, early 20th century. So this is uh, 1908, I believe, in the Gaiety Theory, uh, when the um, British, who are governing South Africa at the time, uh, have established a, um, you know, of course there's, uh, there's already, you know, racial discrimination in terms of blacks and Africans. But then they've introduced a category of Indians. And now Indians are supposed to register and be in a whole other particular category. So the community's got to decide how it's going to deal with that. And this was Gandhi's first real organizing gig because he's still wearing his lawyer clothes, as you'll see. In the, it's not Gandhi, it's Ben Kinkley, but, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty good. And so, so look at how he creates urgency, how he creates hope, and how he translates it into a very concrete and specific ask. new law. All Indians must now be fingerprinted, like criminals, men and women. No marriage other than a Christian marriage is considered valid. Under this act, our wives and mothers are whores, and every man here is a bastard. Yes, they got quite good at this. A policeman passing an Indian dwelling, huh, I will not call them homes, may enter and demand the card of any Indian woman whose dwelling it is. Understand? He does not have to stand at the door. He may enter. I swear to Allah. I'll kill the man who offers that insult to my home and my wife. And let them hang me. <laughs> Talk means nothing. Kill of your officials before they disgrace one Indian woman. Then they might think twice about such laws. In that cause, I would be willing to die. <laughs> Praise such courage. I need such courage because 
In this cause, I too am prepared to die. But, my friends, there is no cause for which I am prepared to kill. Whatever they do to us, we will attack no one, kill no one. But we will not give our fingerprints, not one of us. They will imprison us, they will fine us, they will seize our possessions, but they cannot take away our self-respect if we do not give it to them. Have you been to prison? They beat us and torture us. I said it is. I am asking you to fight. To fight against their anger, not to provoke it. We will not strike a blow, but we will receive them. And through our pain, we will make them see their injustice, and it will hurt, as all fighting hurts. But we cannot lose. We cannot. They may torture my body, break my bones, even kill me. Then they will have my dead body, not my obedience. take a solemn oath in his name that, come what may, we will not submit to this law. values on your opponent, uh, as in, ooh, I'm going to make these guys stand up. Mm, look at this. Let's sing God save the So, putting that aside. Uh, how did he make the challenge real? How did he make it urgent? Yeah? Did you ever picture like, concrete examples of the Yeah. Yeah, was he shy about it? Was he trying to be, uh, create distance? Objectivity? What was he trying to do? How was he, what was he trying to get people to feel? Huh? Angry. I mean, it's a, it's a, I mean, how could you possibly be more to try to anger people? See, anger, dissonance between world as it is and world as it ought to be. Not, out, not rage, but outrage. That kind of anger. And, and he does it by making it very concrete. There's nothing abstract about that at all. So then where's the hope here? Yeah. Well, I guess what's really compelling is that he gets people angry, and then he's like almost trying to rewire their brain to, to think that violence is not the response to anger. The strength actually comes in like holding to being um, not obedient. That's so, where so how does he do that? If, if it's not rewiring the brain, okay, if he's leaving their brains alone, <laughs> but, but he's trying to engage them in a real way, how does he do that? How does he do that? 
how does he go from this anger, and we're going to kill these guys, to this whole other understanding? Yeah. He uses the value of courage. He says, to the one man, I respect your courage, and I will need courage too, and then pivots. So that's one thing. He's not saying, oh, don't fight. Don't, you know, the, you know, he's not afraid of the anger. That's something really important. He's not afraid of it. He embraces it and then begins a process of transforming it. Uh, and as you say, the value of courage is a really a key element. What else? What else is he doing there? How how else does he make this shift? Come on, yeah. Um, he reminds him of the power that they have within themselves that civil disobedience brings. Yeah. So let's like that's actually stronger than, um, as you said, than violence. That that can. It's really interesting because he doesn't say. Somebody's going to save us, or the laws, or whatever. What's he reminding people of? Remember, we talked about power. We talked about power and the interdependence of power. And remember, the bus boycotters decided to walk to work instead of going, instead of riding on the buses because they were ready to do what? What did they recognize? Huh? Basically, that the powerful only derive their power from their obedience. Yeah. Yeah. They all rest on cooperation. They all rest. On, on, to some degree or another, the cooperation of the people in the bush. And so the option of exit, the option of withdrawal, it's always there, maybe costly. It's, it's, it's a very interesting approach. And then, and then so, so he's shifting it back and saying, wait a second, um, you know what? We actually have some choice here that's known as agency. And when you're feeling powerless and a victim and put upon, you lose your sense of agency. You, you feel like... And the first challenge then is to restore some sense of agency. There is some capacity here to make a choice about this circumstance. And so then, so then where does he go with the choice? You say, so good, so sometimes decide to do that. When, when's this choice got to be made? Right now. Why does it have to be made right now? Why does he want it made right then? And if everyone sees the solidarity in the room, then what do people get from that? Huh? Courage, hope, empathy, solidarity, a sense of self-worth. I'm not alone. It's just like the day the, the buses went by with no black faces on. This kind of, except it's right there, right in the room. So then his challenge is, to, how do I turn this into something very specific and very real? And so what does he ask for? What does he ask for? Yeah, and and is it is it mysterious whether a person commits or not? Is it private? Now you know if that first guy hadn't stood up, you can see him kind of sweating it there a little bit. Kingsley's really good. I said, oh, I don't know about this. I have a theory it was his father-in-law, but I don't know that for a fact. But I, Gandhi was very, you know, wouldn't leave things entirely to chance. I, I you know, who knows? But once that one guy stands up, then people begin to stand. And the group has made a choice. And the hope isn't out there somewhere else. It's right there in the room. And it's palpable and it's felt. Now, look, we all don't have Gandhi's job to do and, 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 and aren't in that setting. But if you, if you really look at what's going on here, the way in which the urgency is created, the source of hope, which isn't out there somewhere, it happens to be right here in us. And that's then translated into a specific commitment that is public and is clear. There's a whole lot to learn from this that we can take into our own our own projects and our own ways of doing things, uh, clearly not, uh, you know, not, not that. But we do face this challenge of commitment, of urgency, and hope in terms of translating our wishes into action. So, uh, time's up. Have a, look forward to your papers. Have a good spring break.